Okay, English 1, we're reading the Odyssey, book 21, The Test of the Bow. And it, our story recaps a little bit. Basically, remember, Odysseus is home. Loyalty has been proven by the swine herd, certainly by his son. We're about to see it from Euryclea, the nurse, in a little bit. Also, the dog, Argos, proved loyal, did what had to be do. It's almost a, a positive example of following the chain of command. The chain of command, by the way, was one of those ones I think that was summarized for us. But right when they got back to Ithaca, this is on the trials and tribulations, they're still, he's with his crew, before they get to Scylla and Charybdis. The chain of command, King Aeolus, is on page two of your character chart. He... Uh, gave Odysseus the bag of wind and said he gave him three winds and left him one favorably blowing wind home. And he told his crew, he stayed up for like three days, almost got home. And just as when he's in sight of Ithaca, tells his crew, I'm going to bed. Don't open the wind. Of course, they got greedy or don't open the bag. That's all he said. They didn't know what was in there. He walks out from the king's palace with a sack. Of course, what are his crew going to think? But they didn't follow chain of command. They opened the bag. Blew them off course. They go back to King Aeolus and say, Hey, by the way, my men didn't listen to me, and can you help me out again? And he says, No way. Clearly the gods have something else planned for you. I'm not going to interfere. An example of following the chain of command, or a, 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 a warning, I should say. But also, chain of command, it, we're going to see some other things. Uh, his, We talked about it before. We're going to see some other ones to come. You guys are thinking about other things. Maybe how he was too curious for his own good. Hint, hint. In the cave with the Cyclops. Uh, cockiness. He yells back. If anybody tells you don't, it wasn't nobody. It was Odysseus. And literally almost gets his ship sunk. So these are some refreshers for you. Because you're supposed to be thinking about it this week. There's certainly more examples to come. We are on book 21. Books 18 through 20. Odysseus observes the suitors and finds that two in particular... Antinous and Eurymachus, again, you've got some of these names, you should be having your character chart with you. You can always hit pause, jot stuff down if you need. Antinous and, and Eurymachus are rude and demanding. Antinous, he's the head suitor. Penelope asks Odysseus, the beggar, for news for her husband. He says he has heard that Odysseus is on his way home. Penelope, however, has given up hope for Odysseus's return. She proposes an archery contest to one of the suitors uh, with the marriage to her as the prize. She enters the storeroom and takes down the heavy bow that Odysseus left behind. Well, an example of cunning is at one point Penelope said she was making this burial shroud for, I believe it was Odysseus's mother who had obviously we just died. She died. They, he saw her in Hades. Good soldiers got to do what a good soldier's got to do, right? He was there for other business first. He had to talk to Tiresias, but he did weep for his mother in good time. So she's making a burial shroud, I think, for her. But every night, because she said, let me mourn first, like a good Greek wife should do. When I'm done mourning, then I'll pick a suitor. Well, she didn't want to pick one. So every night she would come down and she would undo all of her work. So during the day, they would see her looming and looming and looming and working and working, but she was never going to finish it. They caught her. So she finally, kind of as a last ditch effort, says, fine, we'll have this contest. She proposes an archery contest to the suitors, and then she is going to be the prize marriage to her. She enters the storm and takes down the heavy bow that Odysseus left behind. Now the queen reached the storeroom door and halted. Here was an oaken sill cut long ago and sanded clean and bedded true. Four squared, the door jams, and the shining doors were set by the careful builder. Penelope untied the strap around the curving handle, pushed her hook into the slit, aimed the bolts inside, and shot them back. Then came a rasping sound as those bright doors the key had sprung gave way. A bellow like a bull's vaunt in a meadow, followed by her light footfall entering over the plank floor. Herb-scented robes lay there in chests, but the lady's white milk-white arms went up to lift the bow down from a peg in its own polished bow case. Now Penelope sank down, holding the weapon on her knees, and drew her husband's great bow and sobbed and bit her lip and let the salt tears flow. Then back she came to face the crowded hall, tremendous bow in hand, and on her shoulder hung the quiver spiked with coughing death. Behind her maids bore a basket full of axe heads, bronze, and iron implements for the master's game. Thus in her beauty she approached the suitors, and near a pillar of the solid roof, 
There is Penelope in her weeping, with Odysseus's bow, the last remnants and memories of the famous hero. So she pauses, her shining veil across her cheeks, her maids on either hand and still, then spoke to the banqueteers, to the suitors. My lords, hear me. Suitors indeed, you commanded this house, not a good verb there, to feast and drink in day and night. My husband, being long gone, long out of mind, you found no justification for yourselves, none except your lust to marry me. Stand up then. We now declare a contest for that prize. Here is my lord Odysseus's hunting bow. Bend and string it if you can. Who sends an arrow through an iron axe helve socket 12 in a line. So she undoes these uh, axe heads and basically forms a tunnel with them. So you got to shoot. Not only is it really hard to string this bow, you got to be strong, but you have to, have to be accurate, and you have to shoot through this tunnel sort of made with these axe heads. I join with my life with his, and leave this place, my home, my rich and beautiful bridal house forever, to be remembered, though I dream it only, meaning her house, and the happy days she had and clearly will not have with these suitors. You've done a wretched thing here, right? You're supposed to have good hospitality as a Greek, and that is not what they have done. Just look at the way they treat the dog, for goodness sakes. Despite heating and greasing the bow, the lesser suitors prove unable to string it. The most able suitors, Antinous, that's the main guy, and then the, you know, man number two is Eurymachus. They hold off, they wait. While the suitors are busy with the bow, Odysseus, still disguised as an old beggar, goes to enlist the aid of two of his trusted servants, Euimus the swineherd and Philotius the coward. Again, Euimus is on your list. He was the one that he went to. Philotius, he is another loyal man. The only two to Odysseus. But again, only you and Mrs. on your list. Two men had meanwhile left the hall, swineherd and cowherd, in companionship, one downcast as the other. But Odysseus followed them outdoors, outside the court, and coming up, said gently, You herdsmen, and you too, swineherd, I could say a thing to you, or should I keep it in dark? No, no, speak, my heart tells me. Would you men, would you be men enough to stand by Odysseus if he came back? Suppose he just dropped out of the clear sky as I did. Suppose some god should bring him. Would you bear arms for him or for the suitors? It's a test of their loyalty. The cowherd said, ah, let the master come. Father Zeus, grant us our old wish. Some courier guide him back. Then judge what stuff is in me and how I manage my arms. Likewise, Eumus fell to praying all heaven for his return, so that Odysseus, sure at least, of these two told them, Well, I am home, for I am he. I bore adversities, but in the twentieth year I am ashore in my own land. I find the two of you alone among my people, longing for my coming. Prayers I have never heard except your own that I might come home again. So now what is in store for you, I'll tell you. If Zeus brings down the suitors by my hand, I promise marriages to both, and cattle and houses built near mine. And you shall be brothers in arms of my Telemachus. Here, let me show you something else, a sign that I am he, that you can trust me. Look, this old scar from the tusk wound that I got boar hunting on Parnassus. Shifting his rags, he bared the long gash. Both men looked and knew, and threw their arms around the old soldier, weeping, kissing his head and shoulders. He as well took each man's head and hand to kiss, then said to cut it short, else they might weep till dark. Break off, no more of this. Anyone at the door could see and tell them. Drift back in, but separately, at intervals, after me. Now listen to your orders. Bit of chain of command, yeah? When the time comes, those gentlemen, to a man, will be dead against giving me bow or quiver. Meaning, they won't want to do it. Defy them. You must bring the bow and put it in my hand there at the door. Tell the woman to lock their own door tight. Tell them if someone hears the shock of arms or the groans of men in hall or court, not one must show her face, but keep still at her weaving. Philotius, run to the outer gate and lock it. Throw the crossbar and lash it. Why are they locking the door? Why do you lock the door at night at your house? What's the difference here? All right, you're keeping out strangers. Odysseus wants to keep them in. He has another plan in store. Justice is best served cold. Or revenge is a dish best served cold, I believe they say. 
Odysseus the beggar asked the suitors if he might try the bow, worried that the old man may show them up. At first they refuse, but Penelope urges them to let Odysseus try. At Telemachus's request, Penelope leaves the men to settle the question of the bow amongst themselves. Two trusted servants lock the doors of the room, and Telemachus orders the bow to be given to Odysseus. And Odysseus took his time for turning the bow, tapping at every inch for borings that termites might have made. While the master of the weapon was abroad, the suitors were now watching him, and some jested amongst themselves, a bow lover, oh, dealer in bows! Maybe he's one like it at home, ah ha ha. Or as an itch to make one for himself. See how he handles it, the sly old buzzard. And one disdainful suitor added this. May his fortune grow an itch for every inch he bends it. But the skilled man in ways of contending, satisfied by the great bow's look and heft like a musician, like a harper, when with quiet hand upon his instrument he draws between his thumb and forefinger a sweet new string upon a peg so effortlessly odysseus in one motion strung the bow then slid his right hand down the cord and plucked it so the taut gut vibrating hummed and sang a swallow's note epic simile example here it makes the unfamiliar familiar it's also very long i mean i'm sure none of you has ever seen odysseus return home after 20 years and easily string his bow but perchance, maybe you've seen a skilled musician pluck the strings of their instrument. So easily did they do it, so too did he. That's the point of the epic simile. In the hush hall, it smote the suitors and all their faces changed. Then Zeus thundered overhead, one loud crack for a sign, and Odysseus laughed at him that the son of crooked-minded Kronos had flung that omen down, like Zeus is on your side. This is a classic movie trope. Someone says, oh, things are going to be okay, and then thunder, lightning. You know there are rough storms ahead, as to these men, these suitors are going to have a rough time of it. And Odysseus laughed with him that the son of the crooked-minded Kronos had flung the omen down. He picked one ready arrow from his table where it lay bare. The rest were waiting still in the quiver for the young men's turn to come. He knocked it, let it rest across the hand grip, and drew, drew the string and grooved butt of the arrow, aiming for where he sat upon the stool. Now flashed arrow from twanging bow, clean as a whistle. Though every socket ring and grazed not one to a thud with a heavy brazen head beyond it. So here he shot it straight on through, but they rang, but he didn't touch it. It was such a clean shot. They almost were singing and he hit the target. So not only did he string the bow, he fired with accuracy. We shall see what happens next on the continuation of ELA 1. We're talking the Odyssey book 21, the test of the bow. We will continue next time.